The following podcast is an exclusive presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Hey folks, Brian Keene here. You know, summer's over. We're entering the fall and then the winter. Halloween's coming up, Thanksgiving, and then of course the holiday shopping season. Speaking of the holiday shopping season, let me tell you about subculturecorsets.com. They've got everything you need for everyone on your list for this holiday season. Clothing, accessories, gifts, books, you name it, they've got it. They sponsor every show on the Project Entertainment Network, including this one. So please give them your business. Visit subculturecorsets.com. There shall come a podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Marvel Comics original superhero non-team convenes once again. The Incredible Hulk, the Savage Submariner, the Master of the Mystic Arts, Doctor Strange, and a dynamic supporting cast of Marvel superheroes battle against evil as the Defenders. Without further ado, true believers, here's your hosts, Brian Keane and Christopher Golden, Excelsior. Hi, this is Brian Keane. And this is Christopher Golden. And welcome back to Defenders Defenders Dialogue. Dialogue. (laughs) Wait, we love that. Let's do it again. (laughs) And welcome back to Defenders Defenders Dialogue. Dialogue. I was actually going to do it. I was going to do it with you, Brian. See, I think this is good. Um, We're going to leave this, by the way. We're going to leave this as the beginning of the show. Okay. I, like I thought it would be pl- good if we did it together. <laughs> you know, what we you know what we can do together, or no? That's a terrible segue. That's a terrible you, segue. You know what? Uh, you know what else goes well together? What's that? The supernatural and crime stories. Really? Yeah, and that's what you get in Blood Business: crime stories from this world and beyond. It's really two books in one anthology, and they are our sponsor for this week, and we thank them for that. Blood Business is about the grift, the scam, the double cross, blackmail and burglary, murder and larceny. Blood Business tracks the underbelly of human nature through the muck of our lesser angels in 27 crime stories set both in this world and beyond. It's edited by Mario Acevedo and Joshua Viola, and it features stories by Edward Bryant, Cat Rambo, Stephen Graham Jones, Alyssa Wong, Cat Richardson, Chris Holm, and many others. And it is on sale right now in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle. So that's Blood Business, Crime Stories from This World and Beyond. We thank them for sponsoring this week's episode. You know, that was a great segue, Brian. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, I, it's almost like I used to do this for a living. <laughs> All I could think about when you were reading that ad, actually, and this is me going on a tangent, is our friend Tom Snagoski, who we spent time with this weekend at the Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival. Um, uh, <laughs> Tom would tell me the story about a, a comics retailer uh, who at comic book conventions had this guy working for him who was, shall we say, not the best person to be uh, to have representing your business. Okay. Um, and, and first of all, he also called comic book characters by very strange names. Instead of the Spectre, it was the Spectra. And, <laughs> and Tom was there once and he overheard the guy. This was how he pitched to a guy who was perusing the, uh, the old comics that were there. Uh, the Spectra? You don't have that? You should shoot yourself. <laughs> and and I actually thought that should be the ad for this book and then I thought no that's wrong because somehow you know we'd both end up getting sued. We would. But we but would. I but I but all I could think about was was the spectra. You don't have that, you should shoot yourself. <laughs> now that's a sales pitch. <laughs> anyway, the opinions of Christopher Golden may or may not represent those of the Project <laughs> Entertainment Network. <laughs> I didn't say anybody should actually do that. I'm I'm repeating a story I was once told by Tom Snagoski. Sue him. You know, you brought up the Merrimack uh, Halloween Book Festival, and and now I'm going to go on a tangent. Uh, this was my first time meeting the legendary Steve Bissett, and uh, I handled it very well. I, I did not fanboy on him. I did not turn into a puddle of goo. Uh, <laughs> I got to be on a panel with him, and I tried to be articulate. Uh but I did get a chance to tell him what his comic series, Taboo, meant to me as a young man and, and how it 
it really helped solidify my career path. And uh, he was very gracious about that. And on today's show, we're going to talk about another writer uh, who was a massive, massive influence on me personally. I suspect on you as well. And that is Mr. Steve Gerber, who uh, takes over the Defenders with today's show. It's something about Steve's. Um, (laughs) Bissett and Gerber. (laughs) Yeah, look, I mean, Steve Gerber... Steve Gerber was this guy, to me, he was the unsung hero of Marvel Comics. Uh, I mean, not unsung by us, obviously, but, you know, for those people who don't understand why we love this series so much, um, you know, obviously, uh, Roy and Steve Englehart and Len, you know, all did a great job with these characters, but Steve Gerber, for some reason, was the one that made it magic for me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the, the weirdness, the way he embraces the, um, the soap opera and the humanity of these characters in their bizarre outfits and, uh, and with their strange powers. But he, I don't know, he just made it real, uh, for the, the kid that I was. So it was such a pleasure to, to read him again. He did um, to me as well. Um, you know, it, you have to remember 70s Marvel up until Steve Gerber. Everybody was, you know, not only was there a house style when it came to art, but there was there was a particularly a house style when it came to writing. I mean, each writer was encouraged to use their own voice. But, you know, there was also an, an edict that, you know, you want to try to st- sound like Stan. Right. Um, and so you had a lot of bombastic dialogue and, and stuff like that. Steve Gerber was the first writer that really started to get away from that and put his own stamp on the characters and the dialogue and the writing. Uh, as we're going to discover in today's show, he, he was, he was doing stuff that had Stan Lee been aware of it, he, he would have probably had an embolism. Well, that's what I was going to say too. Kudos to Roy Thomas as editor for just, you know, letting Gerber do his thing. Yep. Um, so I really, I really admire that. And, and no matter how, we're going to talk about the headmen today. And I know, Brian, that the headmen changed your life. I'm jumping up and down right now. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the headmen, let's face it, this is stupid. Yeah. Um, really, really dumb. And but yet, it makes it work. Yeah. And yet, I loved it. Um, and this is where, like, again, you know, taking Snogoski's name in vain again, this is where Snogoski is like, what is wrong with you people? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I love it. But anyway, so, so we jump in weirdly, um, actually not with the Defenders. We jump in with uh, Marvel 2-in-1 number 6 uh, presents The Thing and Doctor Strange. Uh, yep. And we jump in there because... It's written by Steve Gerber. It's drawn by an artist named George Tuska, famous uh, or, or legendary artist, inked by Mike Esposito, and it is, might as well have been an issue of the Defenders. Yeah, absolutely, and it ties into to uh, when Gerber takes over the Defenders. Exactly. And right away on the first page, you get a you get a sense that oh, the, this is a a different writer, a different style. Uh, we open with a splash page with. Doctor Strange, and what did we decide? Was it pronounced Clea or Clay? Oh, oh, I've always pronounced it Clea. So have I. So, and okay. by the way, I want to point out, I read something the other day. I think about uh, this with my, my sons all the time, especially uh, on Facebook the other day. And this, this applies to comics fans like us. Uh, you know, they said, don't ever make fun of somebody for mispronouncing a word. Uh, it means they learned it by reading. So comics fans, we don't care how you pronounce the names of the characters. You you learned them by reading comics. So there That's you go. Right. But but yes, Clea. So Clea and and Doctor Strange are in the subways of 1970s uh, Lower Manhattan's East Side. I don't know if that was a safe area back then in the 70s or not. Uh, but just the prose from the very first box, you know, the subways of Manhattan's Lower East Side have a hollow feel about them after midnight, an atmosphere of gray foreboding, of indefinable menace. Every noise reverberates against the cold concrete walls and down through the dark labyrinthian tunnels, lending a sinister aspect to even the most innocent of sounds. No disrespect to Stan Lee or Roy Thomas or Steve Englehart, but it's, 
it's very clear something new is, is, is happening here in comics. Well, I mean, I think that something new is that Gerber actually had a bit of a hand at prose, uh, which we'll find out in one of the giant size that we're yep. going to talk about. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of what's going on here, that this reads more like uh, a prose story that we would encounter in an in a anthology of the era, um, even, you know, and again, this is something that sort of we don't do anymore in comics. We don't really tell stories at length in captions. And a lot of people would say, good, we're glad we don't do that anymore. But, you know, when somebody did it as well as Gerber did, uh, I think that was, that was great. But, um, I agree. Anyway, I... so we meet, we meet this girl who's playing a harmonica, uh, a quote unquote mouth harp, um, on the subway platform. And we meet the people around her, um, and she's accosted by this guy, a uh, sort of um, punk ass kid on the uh, on the subway platform. Who it's one of it's one of those nineteen seventies very diverse gangs. Yes, you know, straight out of the Warriors. Yeah, that was uh, just going to say it's it's you know it's out of the Warriors. Uh, it's actually I think he's probably a member of the Yancey Street Gang, which we'll discover yep. later. Um, and uh, basically, he tries to take her harmonica. There's a little bit of a struggle. She falls in front of the train. And when the train goes to hit her, oh, she yells that, that that don't save her. She tells Doctor Strange, don't save her. Get the harmonica. And for some reason, he senses something about her that, that he realizes that that's actually uh, something that he should do. So he grabs the harmonica instead of trying to save her. And when the train doesn't hit her, she explodes into uh, uh, some kind of massive cloud of uh, multicolored light. Yeah, sparks. Yeah, not something you see every day. No. And they envelop and and change in some fashion the people around her, which we can which we can talk about that. Right. Right. The uh, you know the they the people around her are you know, overwhelmed with this, judging by their expressions, you know, this inner peace and, and happiness. And uh, Doctor Strange saves the harmonica, and the gang makes a getaway. And uh, Doctor Strange puzzles over the harmonica. There's one word inscribed upon it, Celestia. And uh, he suggests to Clea that they return to his Sanctum Sanctorum, where he can meditate and consult his ancient arcane texts. I just want to jump in quickly and point out again about that scene that that's that's the kind of thing that you didn't really encounter before Gerber. Uh, this this and I know that there's not a uh, a solid way to say this really, no pun intended, but there's a kind of softness to this story turn to the idea that she explodes in this uh, you know cloud of colorful sparks and it touches all of these people and there's something sort of ethereal about that particular element of the story it isn't just about some supervillain with you know with powers deciding to beat on somebody it's the establishment of a longer story and uh you know and again it's cosmic but it's not cosmic in the way so many marvel stories were in that era right so this is a, it's just different yep. um anyway continue sorry yeah well then we uh we uh, meanwhile, at the Baxter building now, you know, for it occurs to me that a lot of our younger listeners only know the Baxter building as a piece of real estate owned by millionaire playboy Peter Parker. That is so um, sad. It is sad. And fuck you, Ike Perlmutter, if you're listening, but I don't think he is. <laughs> um, the Baxter building was the headquarters of a, a Marvel superhero group now consigned to ancient history and back issues known as the fantastic four. They'll be back. Um, one of their members was the thing who you might know from, uh, his membership in the guardians of the galaxy. <laughs> this is so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I just snorted on our podcast. That was good, Chris. But, uh, yeah, the Marvel two and one, uh, each issue starred the thing and he would, he would team up with another Marvel universe character. And it was, it was a great way for kids like ourselves who, you know, didn't have a large amount of disposable income to sample other Marvel characters that, you know, whose books we might not be reading. Um, so, you know, of course, since this is the thing's book, not Dr. Strange's, of, of course, he's going to show up. Um, he's taking a nap 
and he's he's rudely interrupted um, by a phone call, and uh, it's a, a a woman who it turns out is the grandmother of one of the gang members uh, who tried to steal this harmonica, and uh, she's begging the thing for help. So, he, and, and, uh, and he doesn't mind being woken up uh, in the middle of the night because. It's uh, Mrs. Coogan is her name, and she actually was sort of a second mother to him when he was growing up. When right. his parents were otherwise occupied, Mrs. Coogan would look after him. So when she calls bashful, blue-eyed Benjamin Grimm, uh, he, <laughs> he does not mind jumping in the fantastic car and flying out to Yancey Street, where he grew up. And uh, basically he says that um, if not for her, he probably wouldn't have grown up and, and gotten out of the neighborhood and gone to college and all of that stuff. So he's willing to come and talk to her grandson, Duff Coogan. Right. Who's a member of uh, his nemesis, the Yancey Street Gang. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he, he shows up. He's getting their side of the story. Meanwhile, at the Sanctum Sanctorum, uh, Clea and Wong are watching while Doctor Strange meditates. And, you know, learns more about the, the harmonica. Um, and basically, I mean, basically what he learns... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, basically what we find out there is that um, what the harmonica was, that, that, that the girl playing the harmonica was a manifestation of destiny. Uh, and in Marvel, we had eternity, we had destiny. All of these um, things are um, actual consciousnesses, if that's even a word, it must be. Right. Um, and, uh, and destiny has, has been, um, uh, because the, she was sort of, uh, exploded into her cloud of sparks, uh, the destinies of all the people who witnessed it have been altered, um, in a way that basically it's, it's infecting them. So they're manifesting their their deep seated fears, their um, other concerns. You know, things are happening to them that reflect um, what they think their destiny is, rather than what it actually was to begin with. Right. So Doctor Strange begins to track all the people that were on that subway platform down. Uh, the first two people he visits are this married couple named the Goldbergs, who are getting ready for bed and they're talking about what they witnessed. And uh, the husband Sheldon is is washing his face in the sink. And uh, when he's done, all of his features on his face have vanished. It's just a, a blank mask like, uh, like the, DC's question. Char- the question or Mary San Giovanni's The Hollower. You know, just a, a you know, everything's gone. Um, you know, Doctor Strange enters in his astral form and and fixes, fixes the situation. Um, but... You know, then then we get down to to Sheldon's destiny. He says, I dress like everyone else. I wear my hair like everyone else. And I'm starting to think like them, too, because it's good for my career, good for business. But what about good for me? You know, and he decides he's going to quit the ad agency that that has turned him into this faceless man. And he's going to write that novel he always wanted to write. I always loved those things they, when they showed up in TV and film and uh, and, and in comics. Um, you know, those things don't typically show up in novels because novelists know that quitting your day job to write your novel is not usually a good plan. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I actually played with that trope in my novel Dark, Tal- Dark Hollow. The guy quits his day job to, to write a novel and <laughs> everything bad that happens is because of that very bad decision. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Uh... Well, so then, then the next the next thing that happens is that we go see and uh, Doctor Strange fixes that guy up and 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 we go see Duff Coog and Doctor Strange and and the Thing encounter one another. Uh, they've they've met before, so that's always nice. And again, what I like about these early issues is sometimes, as we'll see in a few minutes, you you have characters meeting for the first time, which is always cool. Um, right. And then a a rat in on Yancey Street is transformed into a giant rat, a reflection of what uh, Duff Coogan subconsciously thinks of himself. And that page that's almost a splash page of the giant rat scaling the building is uh, is certainly the best thing in this issue. Um, <laughs> there's a fight. 
with, with between the thing and the giant rat, but it takes Doctor Strange persuading Duff Coogan to stop being a shitty human being uh, and, and him to go and basically save the thing, uh, you know, which, which is nice. Right. Yeah. And, you know, then when the battle's all over, the thing and Doctor Strange return to the Sanctum Sanctorum, only to find out <clears throat> that Valkyrie was just there a few minutes ago, and she left with the harmonica. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> which leads us to Marvel 2 and 1 number 7 with the thing and Valkyrie. That's right. Uh, uh, this is a, this is cool. By the way, uh, I should mention um, that regular Defenders artist Sal Buscema shows up as the artist in this issue with Steve Gerber uh, writing again and Mike Esposito again on inks. Um, it's uh, it's great because this is the point where you know I kept saying before that it seemed like Len had an idea. Len Wein had an idea of what he wanted to do with Valkyrie, but he never got around to it because he. Right. You know, the character sort of kept putting it off and putting it off. And Gerber, at this point, clearly this is part of his plan all along. He knows exactly what he wants to do with Valkyrie. He, even before, keep in mind, uh, these, these two issues of Marvel 2 and 1 came out before right. he took over Defenders. Yep. Um, and, yeah, he, he hits the ground running. He knows from, from jump exactly what he's going to do with this character. You know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we open with Valkyrie... We open with uh, the homeless man who was on the subway platform in the last issue. One of the people, you know, impacted by these these sparks from destiny. Um, and he's sitting on a park bench. And all of a sudden, Valkyrie comes swooping down out of the sky on Aragorn, her winged horse, and just snatches him up into the air. And they disappear through this, like, this dimensional portal. Um, and then we go back to the Sanctum Sanctorum. And Doctor Strange and the Thing are, you know, recapping the last issue for the reader and, and discussing, you know, how these these shards of destiny have been impacting everybody. Um, well, and they look at uh, Doctor Strange is looking for the Valkyrie because right. he's trying to figure out why she would have come and lied and taken the harmonica, and he finds that instead, in in the guise of Barbara Norris, she's you know peacefully asleep beneath a tree. In the pastoral setting of Cobbler's, is it Cobbler's Roost, Vermont? Yep, Cobbler's Roost, Vermont. And uh, and so, of course, this can't be because she was just in New York. So how is she asleep under a tree in Vermont? Um, and uh, and and then we get that recap of of how we got here in the first place. Um, and then, of course, they decide that the thing is going to go to Cobbler's Roost and investigate, while Doctor Strange uh, stays here and tries to locate the harmonica. Right. So now, a quick spoiler, although it's not really a spoiler. We, If you know from previous episodes, there is one supervillain who has masqueraded as the Valkyrie before, and that is the Enchantress. Um, so, you know, and Doctor Strange knows this. So when he says, hmm, how could Valkyrie have been here to get the harmonica and yet be asleep under this tree in Cobbler's Roost, Vermont? Right. I don't know why it doesn't occur to him, but... Uh, but yeah, anyway, yeah, well, the, you know, I, it ought to, but, uh, you know, maybe he didn't have his coffee that morning. I don't know. Maybe. So, um, uh, the, the thing decides that he's gonna, he's gonna fly off to Cobbler's Roost. And, uh, <laughs> well, I will say you think that if you think that's a plot contrivance, uh, this next bit <laughs> is, <laughs> is just like, you know, the thing in the fantastic car is flying on his way to Vermont and needs gas. Yep. So he sees a gas station in the middle of nowhere and and goes and lands to try to get gas. And he, when he goes to try to wake up the attendant, he gets punched through the window and it turns out to be the executioner. Dun, 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 who we know from previous back issues of the Defenders. Um, and, you know, the thing has fought the executioner before, uh, you know, doesn't really recognize him here because the executioner's not wearing his his Asgardian garb. He's dressed like a gas station attendant. Um, Which again, this yeah. whole thing, we, you know, we we've gone on and on about uh, about how great Gerber is, but but this whole thing is colossally stupid. <laughs> the idea that like that the thing happened to be flying over, and well, we, not even that. I'm just going to cut to the chase, Brian. The, the the executioner and the enchantress have abducted that homeless guy. 
named Alvin Denton and stolen the harmonica. The Enchantress was disguised as Valkyrie. Uh, and, and for some reason, we don't ever understand the Enchantress has created the illusion of this gas station. I have no idea why. Um, and inside, they've got Alvin Denton as a prisoner, and they've got the harmonica. So they created this illusion of, of the gas station in the middle of nowhere for no reason. And the thing happens to see it uh, coincidentally and land to get gas and encounters them. The people who have the very thing he's looking for. <laughs> you know why? You know why? No, why? <laughs> Because Steve Gerber. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was reading the thing, just scratching my head going, what? Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I just, okay. All right. Well, that, so, so in any case, <laughs> uh, so somehow the Enchantress decides she's going to release the thing uh, and Alvin Denton, because she says, they be destiny's captives, executioner, not ours. Denton must meet his fate. So in other words, the, the harmonica is useless to them until all of these people who've been affected by it uh, play out the new, the new destinies that they have acquired. Right. Right. Um, and what we learn uh, about Alvin Denton, mm -hmm. he wasn't always a homeless man. Um, he was once a lawyer. He was one of the best lawyers. You know, he's rich, had himself a Manhattan apartment and a summer place in Vermont. But then his wife was killed in an auto accident. Um, his daughter spent all the following summer with him. Um, but then she met her fiance, Jack. And the two of them fell in with a bunch of cult members, occult, occultists. And after that, she disappeared without a trace. Now, if... Dear listener, you, you think you know where this is leading. You're right. Well, what do we know about Valkyrie so far? She doesn't know anything about her past. Uh, we know that she was a member of a cult and uh, that, you know, the, the undying ones manifested through her. But, you know, her whole backstory in Defenders, you know, from Steve Englehart and Roy Thomas was, I'm, I'm going to find out my past. And we've never gotten to that. Um, well, as we find on the next page... Uh, Alvin, the former lawyer turned homeless man, is in fact Valkyrie's father, or Barbara Norris's the, the, father. The human, the human host of Valkyrie, Barbara Norris. Right. Um, yep. So then, go ahead. Well, sorry. sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say so. So then, uh, uh, the Enchantress and the Executioner show back up <laughs> because now they need to come back on stage, uh, and the Enchantress actually removes the Valkyrie persona from her host, Barbara Norris. Barbara Norris is still insane, um, having been driven insane in early, early issues of the Defenders. Uh, in order to try to save her, her father snatches the harmonica of destiny, as we'll call it, and plays it and basically shatters the world by playing the harmonica. And yet our heroes and villains are floating in the debris of the earth uh, there's a battle for the possession of the harmonica between the thing and the executioner. Uh, and just again, cutting to the chase here, the thing plays the harmonica and repairs the world. And then it's clobbering time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and if that's not, I'm sorry, people could say Avengers assemble all they want, but it's clobbering time is the best catchphrase in the history of Marvel comics. Preach, preach, and uh, it's it's a shame we don't get to see it these days. <laughs> so the thing smashes the executioner, uh, you know, and then uh, I actually loved this ending. And this is, again, as stupid as so much of this issue is, um, I love this ending where, uh, you know, Valkyrie has had the opportunity to potentially uh, find out more about Barbara Norris and about the life that she led to not feel so hollow, but Alvin Denton in all this chaos has been killed. And, and Valkyrie says he's dead. The one man who could have told me all about Barbara, her childhood, her likes and dislikes, her bonds with other humans, all the factors which made her a person and without which I am but an empty facade of fiction. And then bashful Benji Grimm says, uh, uh, 
Whatever you are, kid, it ain't that, or my shoulder wouldn't be getting drenched. Paper dolls don't cry. Only us real people got that problem. There and, you go. And, and I, that, go ahead, yeah. for Tom Sagoski and anyone else who doesn't understand why we love this series, it's it's it seems like that Steve Gerber yep. could humanize these characters in a way very few writers in that era could. Exactly. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, we could identify somewhat with Peter Parker. He, he had some of the same problems we had, you know, growing up. But, you know, Tony Stark... Steve Rogers, Doctor Strange, you, you couldn't identify. They, they they were comic book characters. Right. Steve Gerber comes in and, and makes them human, makes them real, uh, like he just did there with the thing in Valkyrie, uh, which leads into Defenders issue number 20, Steve Gerber's first issue on the book, um, and it picks right up from uh, these these two issues of Marvel 2 and 1. Um, you know, Sal Buscema is still, still doing the art, uh, with Vince Coletta actually finishing the art for him this time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Defenders 20 starts there in Cobbler's Roost, Vermont, uh, literally picks right up where it ended. You know, the battle's over, uh, you know, Valkyrie and still sad, but the Executioner is still moving. So we open with the obligatory fight scene between yeah. Executioner and Thing, and then, uh, Enchantress and Executioner escape. And, and again, uh, when I was reading that, I thought, well, the, of course, the executioner is there and still, you know, uh, ready to fight purely because it's the first issue of a comic that is the aftermath of something. And, and we need the fight scene. But it looks great, of course, with yeah. with, uh, with with Busema on it. Yeah, no, it looks fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you know, Gerber, keep in mind, this is early in his career at Marvel. So he, he, he was breaking the rules when it came to prose and writing style. But even he still had to include the obligatory fight scene at the beginning. Um, now, that's something he would actually play with later in Howard the Duck. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so, yeah, Doctor Strange shows up and, you know, they've got the harmonica. Uh, you know, we get a basically a recap, a two page recap of Marvel two and one. Um, yeah. And then we Lake cut Lake. to Valkyrie car carrying her father's body well now she's and uh, we should we should point out she's she's uh she's put her sword away so she's once again in uh you know street clothes right uh and wanders into cobbler's roost uh a carrying a grown a dead man uh goes into the sheriff's office and what was cool about this and i could i was reading this brian and all i could think was actually the whole story i'm, I'm really curious about the valkyrie that's going to be appearing in thor ragnarok um, she looks like a great character, but I was reading this thinking, you know, this story, the Valkyrie Barbara Norris story, this is great television. Absolutely. This would be great television. Uh, it, you know, so she wanders into town and everybody knows her and she doesn't know anybody. Yep. Yep. One other, one other thing to mention, uh, we told you in last week's podcast, uh, we, we mentioned the, the mysterious, mysterious stranger in the alley who, who seemed to recognize Valkyrie when she was in her Barbara Norris form. Um, he's back, he, and he's here in Cobbler's Roost, Vermont. Sees her walking through the streets, um, and he says somebody named Van Nyborg didn't believe him when he told him he'd spotted her. Uh, so we, we still don't know who this mysterious man is, but it's worth mentioning that he's there. Yep. So she, she wanders through town. She's recognized by all these people. Uh, the thing has, uh, has been snoozing while he's awaiting the arrival of Dr. Strange, uh, and Dr. Strange brings, brings with him Nighthawk, uh, and Nighthawk and the thing have yet to meet. So right. this is, this is another great thing about the evolution of the series, um, and about why Nighthawk is important. And also reading this too, I just kept reminding myself, uh, again, as a, as a character that so many people hate. Nighthawk's costume is fantastic. It is. You know, it is. Just, it's so striking. So, in any case, uh, the thing says, oh, yeah, Clea mentioned something about the Defenders. You guys got a group going or something? <laughs> and and Doctor Strange tries to brush him off. And Nighthawk says, what's the matter, Doc? You embarrassed by the answer to that question? 
Yeah, the the defenders are a group, classy name, our own headquarters. Six or seven members who never want to get together. Some of us show up sometimes, others other times. And Dr. Strange says, Nighthawk! <laughs> it's like, yeah. which I thought was funny. It's like a dad in a 1950s sitcom. And and the and Ben says, yes, yeah, some group, if the FF worked that way, the world would have been destroyed ten times over by now. Nighthawk says, that's what I keep telling him. So, so again, we see this very slow background evolution of the non-team uh, to eventually becoming a team that tries to claim it's a non-team, you know? Right. Uh, anyway. Right. So while that's all going on, Barbara is in her father's house, um, a house she doesn't recognize, you know, family portraits on the wall. She doesn't recognize any of them. Um, and while she's there, she hears footsteps. She draws her sword, turns into Valkyrie, and uh, she's zapped by a by a mysterious figure who apparently can use magic, much like Stephen Strange. Um, and then uh, Doctor Strange, Nighthawk, and the Thing show up outside of her house, and uh, the ground gives way beneath them, and they fall into a trap, a trap door in the yard. Yeah, this is a this is another thing where Gerb is like, this is a I don't know what he was smoking, but it's another thing where he's like, hey, this will work. There's a there's a trap door in the lawn that <laughs> swallows up the thing in Nighthawk, and when they fall into the pit uh, beneath the yard, the guy in the uh, in the fedora who'd noticed <laughs> Barbara Norris before in New York and in Cobbler's Roost is there for no reason. Uh, <laughs> The thing and Nighthawk confront him, and he vanishes. Uh, the, you know, they try to escape. Doctor Strange is trying to get them out. There's some kind of magical field protecting them. And, to, you know, to cut to the chase, Doctor Strange and Valkyrie end up on a slab about to be sacrificed in a satanic ritual uh, run by this guy, Van Nyborg, uh, that was mentioned before. Uh, and it, it's actually not a satanic ritual, I take that back. It's a ritual to try to create, the, the release the mystic energies that the nameless ones can use to enter our universe. Um, and the nameless ones, as our listeners will remember, uh, actually is a single two-headed demon that was once three heads, and the third head was that of Barbara Norris. Being separated from the nameless ones is what drove her insane. Right. Um, so just just that recap, which we get um, right around the same time, we get the revelation that the hooded figure around the room is the hideously ugly, ancient, disfigured Sister Celestia, who is actually the mother of Barbara Norris, who's not dead after all. She's a member of the cult and is willing to trade her daughter's life to to uh, get back her youth and beauty. Yep. Um, so, you know, now Valkyrie has learned a little bit about Barbara Norris's life. She's probably wishing she hadn't, uh, <laughs> you know, things look grim for Dr. Strange and Val, uh, you know, Van Nyborg has them down on this altar. Um, he's got this twin pronged fork, uh, that <laughs> Steve Gerber writes it pulsates, sucking energy from the brains of Valkyrie and Dr. Strange. Uh, and we start to see the nameless ones materializing. But just at that moment, uh, the thing and Nighthawk break free, and then it's clobber in time with the cultists. Um, My favorite bit in this whole fight scene, Brian, is, <laughs> is this thing on um, when when uh, the thing has grabbed the harmonica. Or no, not the harmonica. What, oh, yeah, he grabs the harmonica and, and smashes it. Uh, but my favorite bit here is this caption where Gerber seems to be uh, sad that the Hulk is not in this issue. Yeah. Because he, he wishes the Hulk was here because he needs a line of dialogue. So he says, The unreasoning Hulk might have spent his power on the cultists or Celestia or even the nameless ones themselves to little avail. But the harmonica would have been beneath his notice. Quote, Dumb music can't help girl or magician. <laughs> so he's saying why we need Ben Grimm in the story and not the Hulk, but at the same time, man, he wishes the Hulk were here so he could write that line of dialogue. Exactly. Uh, in any case, with the harmonica destroyed, the whole uh, business unravels, and and that's the end. And once again, we get the thing as the uh, as the one comforting everybody. 
Yep, exactly. Exactly, which takes us right into Defenders 21. Uh, this is a very important issue. You know, we've talked about the Defenders Rogues Gallery. You know, we've got Yandroth. We've got Zemnu. You can hear the excitement I, rising in Brian's voice. We've got uh, Nebulon, the Celestial Man. <laughs> uh, but at the top of their Rogues Gallery, the, the Doctor Doom to their Fantastic Four, the Kingpin that is so sad. to their Daredevil, the, <laughs> the Galactus to, to their They're Silver Fantastic Surfer. Four. We have oh, so the so Headmen. Yes, and, and this, this issue is actually called Enter the Headmen. Right. Uh, once again, Gerber writing Pusema on art with Sal Trapani as Inker. Inker. Uh, we open with the thing departing. Um, and then... Barbara Norris, while Valkyrie is sitting looking at a, uh, a book that Barbara Norris's parents had prepared, uh, as many parents do, with uh, photos of her growing up and a little bit of her sort of history. Um, and she's she's looking at it, trying to learn about herself, really. Right. Um, now, there's something. There's, I want to pause there for a moment. I, for those who are reading along with us, I want you to look at those two pages, okay? Because here's an example of Gerber flexing his muscles and, and breaking free of the standard Marvel mold. Um, it's a two page spread. All right. But that, that bottom panel takes up two pages. You know, if you're reading a comic book back then you read one page, then you read the next page. No, in this case, you have to read across two pages the whole way, but that, that entire bottom panel, you know, it's, it's, it's an actual photo album and Gerber wrote the text you know, in between. And it's just, it's a, nowadays we're, we're very used to things like this, but for seventies, for bronze age, Marvel and DC, this, this was something very new and very different. Uh, you know, of course, Will Eisner, Wally Wood, they had been experimenting with panels and things in the fifties, but Chris and I weren't reading comics in the fifties because we hadn't been born yet. <laughs> or, you know, the forties, whenever Will Eisner was doing the spirit. My point is this may seem you know, just uh, par for the course not, these days. Yeah, arbitrary to you, but but th this panel, you know, the the way this page is designed, it's really important. Um, and it was Gerber who told Salby Sima to to draw it like this, and it, it it's experimental and it's groundbreaking and it, it's important. You know. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, I also think that again we have Gerber. You know, Hawkeye. Uh, there's a thing about Valkyrie. Um, and again, it's the 1970s, although it's not that different in 2017 in for, for a lot of guys. Um, Valkyrie, despite her strength, uh, is that classic damsel in distress when it comes to her emotional state because she's so lost. She's troubled, deeply troubled. And so, right. of course, these guys with their hero complexes uh, are constantly trying to save her. And so, interestingly enough, as much as Doctor Strange is an asshole, um, he is content in all of this time to sort of let her work it out. To not, and I don't, when I say let her, I mean to, you know, to not decide he's going to try to fix things for her. Right. Um, and, but, uh, but Hawkeye, you know, sort of uh, had that thing where he fell in love with her, just, you know, uh, supposedly. Um, right. Or he was hitting on her. Nighthawk, though... More so than Hawkeye. You know, Nighthawk clearly thinks that he's got a connection to her that she doesn't see because, uh, you know, basically he didn't know she had a husband. Oh, well, she, she, didn't, she didn't know she had a husband. <laughs> and when he learns about it, she says, uh, well, this is no concern of yours. And he says, yeah, I just figured that out. It's okay. Give hubby my fondest regards. I've got another iron or two in the fire anyway, so to speak. And he sort of storms off, and she says, did I say something wrong? He sounded so upset. And Dr. Strange says, you were unaware that Nighthawk felt great affection for you? Like, how could you miss it? But again, she has had no experience in life. Um, but I just thought, I actually thought it's an interesting scene in the sense that, you know, you have this sort of typical 1970s machismo from Hawkeye, and you kind of have the same from Nighthawk, but there's more to it here. Yeah, well, Nighthawk actually is really bummed 
Um, and it, and that is again a testament to Steve Gerber. He's right. humanizing these characters in a in a way that hadn't really been done up until this point. Yeah, you know. Yep. Uh, we then cut to Westbury, Connecticut, <laughs> and the home of George and June. Now, you're going to see George and June pop up a couple times in Steve Gerber's run. Uh, they are recurring characters. George, he's on his way to the golf club. June wants him to pick up a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. And uh, George opens his door and he freaks because Westbury, Connecticut is a safe haven no more. For leaping across the continent on the world's most powerful legs, a certain incredible green giant has chosen to pause here to watch these happy little children at play. He likes children. Their laughter soothes his spirit, makes him smile. Uh, so me, meanwhile, what you what what you have here? Uh, an incredible panel by Sal Buscema. The Hulk is watching these little kids jumping rope, and the Hulk is happy. He's smiling. He's content, and the kids are not bothered at all by his presence. Uh, but in the background, you see all the adults in their their work clothes and their pajamas, and they're just they're freaking the fuck out. <laughs> well, and then you turn the panel, and Hulk is kneeling. And, like, basically patting the little girl's head, little girl jumps good, not good as Hulk, but Hulk is not pretty as little girl. And she says, I think you're pretty, mister. I never met anyone green before. <laughs> and, of course, then you have the father who's clearly filling his pants at the sight of, of his daughter's head being patted by the Hulk. Yeah, George, George runs out of the house and comes charging at the Hulk and bounces off of him. And Hulk says, did something hit Hulk? And then, uh, you know, of course, Hulk gets angry. Once again, dumb, puny humans are, are trying to fuck up his fun. And with one clap of his hands, he smashes George and June's house into to ruins. Um, and the little girl gets mad. She starts hitting him. She says, you're not nice. You broke my house. You hurt my daddy. And I hate Hulk, you. Yeah. And the Hulk starts crying. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, he's sorry. Which I'm he's laughing, sorry. but you look at it, you're like, oh no, that's so sad. Yeah. And he, he, he flees, he jumps away because, you know, the little girl's mad at him. <clears throat> and, uh, <laughs> we end with George and June looking at the ruins of their house saying, you know, we're, we're ruined. We've got nothing. Uh, but oh, George, we will meet you again. Steve Gerber has only begun to play with you. Uh, the reason we're being shown this scene in Westbury, Connecticut is because of George and June's strange neighbors. Um, and that is of course the head men. Uh, now what we should mention, Chris, the head men were actually 1950s characters. Um, back in the day before Marvel comics was Marvel comics. Uh, it used to be a company named Atlas. Uh, and the head men appeared in, in their, the horror comics that Atlas did during the day. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Arthur Negan, a.k.a. AKA Gorilla, <laughs> Gorilla Man. A.k.a. Gorilla Man. Yeah, now, I can hear Tom Stagowski giggling already at us. But, uh, well, this would be Stagowski's favorite character. As much as as much as much he hates as he hates the headman or he thinks they're stupid, I'm sure he likes uh, Gorilla Man. Uh, <laughs> um, Dr. Negan... First appeared in Mystery Tales number twenty one. I'm looking at it now. It's September fifty four. In a in a story called Brian, it walks erect. Yeah, basically his origin story. He's a, a brilliant, brilliant scientist um, and surgeon, and he's he's doing experiments on gorillas, uh, but he's he's very unkind to them. And the super smart gorillas fight back, and they transplant his head onto a gorilla's body. Uh, <laughs> So he, he yes. has the strength, strength and abilities of a gorilla, but the you know uh, the the mind uh, <laughs> that, that can match Reed Richards or, or Doctor Strange. Well, uh, or he'd like to think so. And, and listen uh, to our listeners: if you think that sounds stupid, you're right. <laughs> it's really stupid, um, and yet the beauty of what Gerber does is he takes it completely seriously. You know, you got to play this stuff straight. Um, it, we'll talk about the third member when we get to him in a, in a few minutes, but the second one that we meet in this same scene with Negan is Dr. Gerald Morgan, who first appeared in World of Fantasy number 11, 
Uh, the story was called Prisoner of the Fantastic Fog, which, again, April 1958, that title alone is fantastic. Who wouldn't want to read Prisoner of the Fantastic Fog? I know Charles Rutledge would want to read that. Exactly. Now, uh, what Gerber has done, as we'll find out later in, in his run on the Defenders, he's kind of updated their origin stories. Um, uh, Dr. Morgan, when you look at him, he looks like uh, the old Dick Tracy villain, Pruneface. His, yeah. his facial features are all sagging. Um, we, we will come to find out, I don't think it's mentioned in this issue, but we'll come to find out that he was trying to recreate Hank Pym's experiments. Hank Pym is, of course, Ant-Man, Giant-Man, um, later on the Yellow Jacket, who actually becomes a defender later on. But uh, the experiment went horribly, horribly wrong, and his bones shrunk and his face didn't. So... <laughs> Yeah, so he's so he looks like one of those wrinkly dogs. I can't think of the sharp. He looks like a Sharpe, yeah. basically. Uh, and he's got a formula that he has completed, and we don't know exactly what it does, and we won't find out this issue exactly what it does. Right. Um, anyway, we cut back to Cobbler's Roost, where Valkyrie visits Mrs. Lafferty's boarding house in search of her husband Jack, uh, who is not at home, and she's told off nastily by Mrs. Lafferty. Um, you know, in defense of Jack, thinking that, you know, that, that Barbara wants a divorce uh, to try to get some money that Jack's father left him. And she says, uh, that's all you're after, security, for when you ain't pretty no more and you can't find no fancy pants New York artist like this one, meaning Doctor Strange, to take care of you. Um, oh, Mrs. Lafferty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the less said about that, the better, Mrs. Lafferty. Um, but we, we transition to... Uh, again, Gerber humanizing these characters, but given some of the controversy with current Marvel, I, I want to point out to people something that was happening in 1975. Uh, we have Nighthawk. He's sulking over the fact that it turns out Valkyrie is married. Um, he's, and he, he thinks to himself, you know, I had it coming, left myself wide open. I've just got a weakness for weird women, I guess. <laughs> First, he thinks about his his former girlfriend, Trish. Uh, sometimes she goes by the name Trixie. Sometimes she goes by the name Trish. Trish, she's a, a hippie-turned fashion model who hates her career but won't give it up. And then, in thinking about the Valkyrie, he says, and now a female Thor who's already somebody's wife. I just, I laughed out loud when he said female Thor. You know, for for all of you who think that this is something new, you know, that, that Marvel's trying to check off the diversity card. Fuck you. Here it is, 1975, Steve Gerber, <laughs> female Thor. Okay? You, <laughs> so well, you want to so, tell them what happens next? Because I'm going to get up and get a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, all right. So uh, Trixie, also known as Trish Star, comes in, uh, you know, and the short version of this is that Nighthawk or Kyle Richmond uh, rekindles his old relationship with Trish in a an hours long conversation, which he, by the way, when he st she stumbles in on him or he stumbles in on her in his place, he's in costume, which leads to him revealing his entire history uh, to her and everything that's happened up until now. We cut away to Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum, and Doctor Bruce Banner is uh, is staggering up. Uh, inside, Doctor Strange and Clea uh, are trying to comfort Valkyrie, uh, who just doesn't want to be bothered. Uh, there's a knock at the door. They answer it. Bruce Banner collapses and passes out in a chair in Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum. But you know, you know what's important about that? What's that? Um, you know, when Banner, when Banner wakes up, he wakes up in an alley across the street from the Sanctum Sanctorum. And remember, at this point in Marvel history. Banner can't remember what Hulk has been up to and vice versa. Right. So he uh, he says, you know, I can only surmise Hulk must have been through some going through some emotional crisis. Um, he must have been headed here to Dr. Strange's house. So what Gerber has done here, he he's solidified the fact that this is now the only family the Hulk has. These are the only people he trusts. These are the people he turns to when he's hurting. Right. And, you know, I, I think that's beautiful. 
Uh, we turn the page and we meet the third member of the Headmen, uh, Chandu the Mystic, who right. first appeared in Tales of Suspense number nine in May 1960, uh, in a, uh, plotted by Stan Lee, uh, scripted by Stan's brother Larry Lieber. I, people forget that, uh, uh, Stan's last name is actually Lieber, and, uh, and Larry wrote the Spider Man comic book strip in newspapers for decades. Yep. Um, anyway, uh, Nagin, uh, and, uh, his melted faces, fa- face companion, uh, have contacted Chandu the Mystic, and for some reason, unbeknownst to us, Chandu has consented to have this formula that M- Dr. Morgan has created, uh, injected into his brain by a guy with a gorilla body. <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> this brilliant mystic has decided, sure, what the fuck, I'd like to, you know, have my my consciousness expanded. Uh, the short version of this is that as a result, for some reason, Chandu is able to use his magic and this uh, expanded consciousness to create a weird, invisible black rain uh, that falls all over the city of New York. And anyone who's sleeping at the time is driven mad, uh, including Trish Starr. Who, uh, who Nighthawk prevents from jumping off the building. People are going mad in the streets, but of course, who else was asleep at the time, Brian? Uh, Dr. Bruce Banner. <laughs> and he wakes as the Hulk. Well, he doesn't wake. In a, in a very strange state between sleep and consciousness, the Hulk goes berserk in the streets. Uh, and, and, and weirdly, through all... This is what makes me so sad. All of their bizarre science machinations... Uh, only exist so that Gorilla Man can go rob a jewelry store. Yep. Uh, this is like, we've. I mean, this is what you needed to do? I mean, you couldn't come up with a better plan than injecting a serum into Chandu the Mystic's brain and causing, like, nightmare rain to fall on the city? But but much like, you know, some of the, the right-wing extremists like Timothy McVeigh, plotted back in the 90s, he's going to use his earnings from robbing all these jewelry stores to to conquer the world. <laughs> yes, so. he says, it's. I feel like the headmen are Steve Gerber's version of Pinky and the Brain, although they didn't exist at the time. <laughs> but in any case, Nighthawk saw Gorilla Man in action and, and interacted with him so that when it's all over, uh, Doctor Strange is saying, we don't know what's going on, and Nighthawk lands and said, actually... I'm pretty sure it's this dude with the gorilla body. Uh, so that's the end of the issue when uh, they've realized that this is the weirdest menace we've ever faced. Right. And we agree. Um, we agree. I think, you know, Brian, my suspicion is that you're going to want to talk about uh, uh, Giant Size Defenders number three more than I'm going to want to talk about it. Not really, but I am going to want to spend some time on Giant Size Number Four. Yeah, me too. So, so why don't we just quickly wrap up on Giant Size Number Three? That would be good, and we'll and we'll pick up with Giant Size Number Four next week. Um, the the there are two things that I want to talk. Well, three things to mention from my perspective about Giant Size Number Three. Um, the first is the credits. <laughs> uh, Steve Gerber, Jim Starlin. And Len Wein plotted it. Steve scripted it. Starlin did the layouts. And Dan Adkins, Don Newton, and Jim Mooney finished the art. Uh, so, needless to say, this was a team effort. Um, and it to reads get it like out one. on time. Yeah, it reads like one. Um, it's one of those issues that that is uh, that doesn't really have a purpose. It's a. Uh, it's actually. For those who are familiar with the concept um, of contest of champions, uh, and with the grandmaster, who's a, a um, you know another one of these sort of cosmic beings who tries to sort of play games literally with uh, Marvel heroes, um, you know again it's it's the grandmaster versus I don't even remember the name of the robot character, um, and the gra- what isn't it? Kang? Oh, in this issue, isn't it? Grandmaster and Kang the Conqueror? No, Kang was the earlier one. Uh, the oh, earlier okay. time that they put... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Point is that uh, five defenders, including Submariner, who has very little to do here, uh, uh, are recruited, as well as Daredevil making his first appearance in uh, 
uh, in the Defenders, and he initially thinks Hawkeye, excuse me, Nighthawk is a bad guy. Um, anyway, so the first thing, of course, is uh, the credits. The second thing is the presence of Daredevil, um, which is cool, just in the sense that Daredevil's meeting them for the first time. Actually, and he, you know, he he is a defender, so you know, yeah, this is his his first exactly. uh, time with the group. Yeah, he he, he is. He, this is the first appearance of Daredevil in the Defenders, and he becomes a member briefly. He's also, of course, a member in the television series. Um, the third thing is the presence of a couple of pages that are almost entirely prose. You right. mentioned before the idea that, you know, that Gerber would show his chops as a prose writer, and he does here. And look, I'm not saying it's the greatest prose ever, um, but it's solid, you know, it's 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 completely solid. So Absolutely. Basically it's uh it's a page of text with with one picture. Yep. Um, you know, and it's not text in like caption boxes or word balloons. No, it's straight text. Right. Just like a, a prose novel. Uh, yeah. This wasn't the first time he did that. He, the first time he did it was with uh, Giant Size Man Thing. There's a there's a title that's fun to say. Giant Size Man Thing number four, <laughs> uh, which is is we should probably do a show about Man Thing when we finish Defenders. But <laughs> it, it, Giant Size Man Thing four, it it is some dark shit for seventies comics. It, it's about bullying and suicide and it, it predates columbine by several decades uh but you know that that issue was full of these textual pages uh but man thing was sort of on the outskirts of the marvel universe you know here here we are the defenders one of marvel's biggest selling titles at that time and now he's introducing this concept to to mainstream superhero comics yeah very cool uh, uh, and then the you know the issue basically is uh, characters are paired off um, they end up fighting, you know, essentially monsters. Um, the less said in general about this issue, the better. And again, just because it, for me, this kind of thing is sort of boring because there's no real story point. Um, the one thing I will say, though, in addition, is that the Hulk is put up against uh, <laughs> a a tiny little dude with antenna called Grot the Manslayer. Uh <laughs> And and Hulk says, "Huh, you want to fight Hulk?" Uh, so Grot actually kicks the Hulk's ass. Um, but the thing that I love best, and the the thing that is so memorable, one of the most when I when I came across it again, I was like, "Oh, I remember this so well." Um, Grot kicks Hulk's ass, and Hulk is under a pile of debris, and Grot is now up against Doctor Strange, and he is. Uh, He's bragging to Doctor Strange about how he defeated the Hulk. He says, I take the energy from the sun and transmute it into psychokinetic force or into an impenetrable shield. The green brute could not harm me because he could not touch me. But while he's saying this, the Hulk's hand is coming up out of the debris behind him. And then there's this great panel where the Hulk's hand is, his fingers are bent into the very familiar to all of us. We know what this means. The I'm about to flick you uh, yep. hand gesture. And then on the top of the next page, we just see POW on the left side of the panel. And Doctor Strange standing there with his head turned watching as Grot the Manslayer is flung across the panel by Hulk <laughs> flicking him. And I remember laughing out loud when I first read that scene. Uh, and again, honestly, to me, that's the highlight of this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, this issue, it, it, it is what it is. It's a filler issue. Um, right. You know, like I said, or like we said, you know, it's notable for Daredevil's first appearance, the text pages. That scene is great. The only other thing that brought me joy is I always thought Korvac was a really cool villain. Uh, Jim Starlin had used him in the pages of Captain Marvel, and it was nice to see Korvac show up here and, and fight Doctor Strange. So, But that that's really all you can really say about this issue. Yeah, so we also next issue, uh, next issue, next episode, we will discuss giant size number four, uh, and likely uh, 22, 23, 24, 25 of the defenders. That's my now, suspicion. If I, if I remember correctly, that's uh, the big crossover with Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Uh, uh, no, Guardians of the Galaxy actually will be next time. Oh, uh, this okay. Is actually, giant size uh, number four. Um, is uh, has the Squadron Supreme and Yellow Jacket in it, or Squadron Egghead. Sinister, I should say, and Yellow Jacket in it. Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, again, not you know, not a lot to talk about in that issue, but but still a, a little bit more story uh, because it does involve the the lives of uh, Nighthawk and Trish Star, and um, so there is there's more character stuff to talk about than just a bunch of uh, fighting. Absolutely. Uh, one more time, I want to remind folks: this week's episode was brought to you by Blood Business. Crime Stories from This World and Beyond. It's two books in one anthology. The Grift, The Scam, The Double Cross, Blackmail and Burglary, Murder and Larceny. Blood Business tracks the underbelly of human nature through the muck of our lesser angels in 27 crime stories set in this world and beyond. Uh, That is on sale right now in paperback, hardcover, and for Kindle. Uh, in the words of Chris Golden, buy this. If, if you don't own this book, you ought to shoot <laughs> No, no, no. I didn't say that. <laughs> that is not part of the official ad <laughs> oh. Uh If you folks enjoy this show, all three of you who are listening, um, you know what? Actually, I know for a fact Victor Laval listens because he brought it up in, a, in an email to me last night. So, hi, Victor. <laughs> and we we know Scott Edelman listens. Uh, we're going to actually have Scott on here in a, a few episodes. We're going to talk about his, uh, you know, he uh, he did a, a an issue of Foom featuring the Defenders. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his friendship with Steve Gerber and what it was like to be working in the Marvel bullpen when, when Steve was doing all this crazy stuff on the Defenders. Uh he listens. So there's at least two listeners. So hi to both of them. But if you enjoy listening to this, uh, you might want to check out Chris's podcast, Three Guys with Beards, which he co-hosts with uh, James A. Moore and Jonathan Mayberry. Or you might want to check out my podcast, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, which I co-host with Mary San Giovanni, Dave Thomas, Mike Lombardo, and assorted uh, other people. Both of those are available right here on the Project Entertainment Network. Also, our engineer, Tommy Clark, he's got a podcast here you might want to check out as well. Necrocasticon, also available here on the Project Entertainment Network. And Defender's Dialogue is also available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms. Um, That's it for this week. Chris, you got anything else? Excelsior, Brian, Excelsior. Excelsior, true believer. We'll see you next week, folks. The Necrocasticon, the podcast that blends horror and heavy metal properties with a common connection. Brought to you by hosts, Talking Tom Clock, Max Axe, Smoking Hot Hades, and Azriel Mordecai. Featuring interviews and more with the stars of metal and horror. The Necrocasticon, Mondays on Project Entertainment Network. This has been an exclusive presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. 